Sunday, December 16th, 1934. This afternoon, I plan to address you on another phase of our money situation as related to the program for permanent public works. Also, I shall touch upon a question which is closely allied to our money. This second part of my address will explain why I have named this lecture The Merchandisers of Murder. Last Sunday, if you recollect, I outlined a plan of permanent public works, conscious of the fact that we have reached that stage in our mass production activities when machines are constantly and increasingly displacing men, I believe that unless we are willing to wait for the certain revolution which cannot be avoided, profitable work and just wages must be provided for every citizen who is willing to earn his livelihood. Further delay is only inviting disaster. No one likes the word revolution. No one has read a chapter of revolutionary history, be it French or Russian, cares to envision what might happen in placid America. But on the other hand, no one is so egotistical as to think that five or ten or fifteen million men forced with their families to live in want and below the American standard can be placated by pious preachments on patience. Words cannot change the basic elements of human nature. With this thought in mind, I proposed that a permanent plan should be set up immediately to build roads, to plant trees, to harness the St. Lawrence, to reclaim 60 million acres of agricultural land, and to construct habitable homes for the millions of our citizens who are forced to live in the pigsty of slums. The purpose behind my proposition is to give each man who is willing to work an opportunity to use his brain and his brawn to make his own living according to his own ability. This I conceive to be the duty and function of a government that deserves to be called a government, for a government merely to guarantee a minimum wage without guaranteeing a job where that minimum wage can be obtained is just another pious platitude. As a matter of fact, the job should come before the wage. The advantage to be gained by a permanent public works program is evident. When industry reaches the point of having produced all the clothing, the motor cars, the refrigerators, and other goods which are required or which can be purchased by reason of the ever-increasing pur purchasing power resulting from mass productionism, then the laborers can be engaged by the government in this public works program. Instead of being encumbered by an army of idle laborers, the nation will have an army of productive citizens helping to create actual wealth for the next generation. The saplings which they plant will grow to sturdy pine and hemlock, cedar and oak. The acres which they reclaim will be virgin soil from which the children of future years can reap bountiful harvests. The highways and power developments will be real wealth for us to pass on to the future years, as real as the wealth represented by the homes, the farms, the water mills, and the highways, which our pioneering forefathers coined for us from the savage forests and windswept plains 150 years ago. Real wealth, I repeat. But as logical and as practical as this seems, what is the obstacle which obstructs it? Why the hesitation? I will tell you. In brief, my friends, it is nothing more than a satanic money system, which is not only incapable of serving the necessities of our modern civilization, but which actually perverts the blessings of God that have come to us through inventions of the scientist and through all the agencies which have tamed a hostile nature or which have wrestled her secrets from her. The money question is the obstacle, and the hesitation is due to the determination on the part of those in power to preserve that money system. This age of plenty in which we are living is, from a material standpoint, the closest that fallen man has ever come to the Garden of Eden. 
spot like grinning devils. There stand at the gates of this Eden of plenty the protectors of privately manufactured money. With the flaming sword of greed in their hands, they forbid you people to enter. What care these men for facts? They realize that the sun never again will dawn on a day when industry will be able to assimilate the millions of idle laborers. They realize that scientists will continue inventing machines, new labor-saving devices. Despite this knowledge, they persist in experimenting with piddling policies excoriated for and by the private bankers. Their one abomination is to preserve the lie that money is wealth. Their one determination is to hold fast to their unconstitutional right of coining and regulating the value of money and of controlling the credit without which not a wheel can turn, not a single grain of wheat can grow. Now the essential thought associated with my proposal of a permanent public works program demands that we destroy the banker's lie relative to money. Money is not wealth. It is only the medium for trading wealth. Money is not wealth. It is only the ambassador representing wealth. Money is not wealth. It is only the receipt for wealth. When real wealth vanishes, then the usefulness of the medium is at an end. All the gold in the world could not buy a glass of water for a thirst-stricken man lost in the sand dunes of the Sahara. When wealth, the real king, dies, his ambassador's pronouncements are idle words. When real wealth decays and rots, all the receipts for it are as valueless as it is a title or deed to a farm which existed on the banks of the Nile in the days of the pharaohs. By some satanic method, s these self-evident truths became so perverted that the high priests of finance succeeded in imprisoning real wealth and binding the wheel of economic slavery all those who did not share their right of coining and manufacturing money. Before this permanent public works program can be operated, it is necessary that the money to be employed for it shall be federal United States money, not banker's money. It shall be represented by the roads which we built, the trees we plant, the electric power which we create, and the homes which we construct. This $10 billion program must be accomplished with United States money. To attempt it with bankers' money is to attempt the financial murder of the youth of today who, unescapably, will be forced to bear the imponderable burdens of tomorrow's debts. What is the salient difference between these two types of money, bankers' money and United States money? It is simply this. If $10 billion were borrowed from the bankers at 4% for this public works program, it means that in 18 years hence, the people of this nation would owe these bankers, at compound interest, $20,256,480. In 18 years, we would owe more than twice what we borrowed. In 18 years, a great portion of the profits derived from the reclaimed acreage, from the electric power, from the planted trees, from the new homes would be acquired by the bankers and not by the people. In 18 years hence, the bankers who today will would gladly manufacture checkbook money to the extent of $10 billion dollars, could demand that we repay them 20 million of legitimate currency which has not and will not be created. In 18 years hence it means that, despite the wealth resultant from the public works program, the next generation would be suffering from a depression more terrible than the one which we are experiencing. 
If we should enter upon this project of public works with United States money, we would be expected to repay more than no more than ten billion to the government, plus the mere cost of bookkeeping. In the meantime, our nation's workmen would have created ten billion worth of real wealth. Now let us pause to get the banker's viewpoint on this method of producing prosperity by the way of banker's bonds of banker's money. In this way, we will learn from their own spokesmen the difference between banker's money and United States money. In the year 1862, the armies of the North and South were engaged in mortal conflict. Over battlefields, vultures and buzzards were hovering to prey upon the corpses of slain soldiers. Closeted in comfort and in safety, there were other vultures and buzzards waiting for the opportune moment to profiteer upon the misery of a stricken nation. Let me read for you a widely distributed pamphlet known as Hazard Circular, which was placed upon the desks of bankers and businessmen in that year of our nation's purgatory. It reads in part as follows. Slavery is likely to ab be abolished by the war. This I and my European friends are in favor of, for slavery is but the owning of labor and carries with it the care of the laborers, while the European plan, led on by England, is that capital shall control labor by controlling wages. The great debt that capitalists will see who it is made out of the war must be used to control the volume of money. To accomplish this, bonds must be used as a banking basis. It will not do to allow the greenback, as it is called, to circulate his money any length of time, as we cannot control that. But we can control the bonds, and through them, the bank issues. What a noble thought excogitated by profit-seeking cowards while their fellow men lay maimed and mangled upon the battlefields of freedom. They will profiteer on bond issues. They will not be content to permit a nation, bowed down in grief and prostrate by debt, to work out its own salvation. They will set out to control wages and to eliminate national coinage by the substitution of interest-bearing, tax-exempt bonds upon the foundation of which the structure of national banks is erected. Slavery is likely to be abolished by the war, so thought the bankers. Well, for this we were really glad. They were glad because under slavery the slave owner was forced to feed and clothe and house the men who worked on his plantation. But here was something better for the banker than the slavery of old. Here was a new system by which the laborer would be paid only while he worked, only while production was in progress. Under the new system, the laborer must shift for himself. The responsibility of the slave owner in times of idleness was at an end. The new system, operated by bond issues, was more efficient to exploit the people. Yesterday they placed shackles upon the ankles of the slaves. Tomorrow they would place on the shoulders of the future generations an unbearable debt which would bow them down under a more wicked kind of slavery, economic slavery. It was esteemed profitable for the financiers represented by the Hazard Circular in 1862 to issue bonds both to control the volume of money and to wax rich upon the heartaches of widows, the tears of orphans, and the poverty of a nation. I presume that this same philosophy is esteemed as righteous in the era of perfected bond manipulation. We have spent about $8 billion on debt relief activities during the past two years. These eight billion dollars are all represented by bankers' bonds. This is great news for the youth of today. Who can analyze the logic which maintains that the issuance of government currency 
is unsound inflation, while the printing of interest-bearing bonds is sound inflation, just because there are little coupons on the end of them. No one but the banker, then, can be opposed to our plan of entering upon a program of permanent public works with United States money. This permanent program of public works operated by United States money is the only sound solution for unemployment. It is good for labor, good for the agriculturalist, good for the industrialist who wants products to flow from his factory, but it is terrible for the banker-controlled industrialist and the banker. American common sense must dictate our future policies on matters of money. The experts and the professionals have proven to be nothing more than bunglers and exploiters. Caesar, advocating freedom to the gallow slaves, the barons of feudalism promising home ownership to the agrarian serf, George III shedding tears of sympathy for the American patriots, these could be more readily believed in the cause of liberty than can the DuPonts, the Mellons, the Morgans, the Baruchs, and the Warburgs parading their financial falsehoods under the cloak of justice and truth. They never gave a judgment except for their personal profit. This day belongs to the common sense of the common American people for their common good. May I now speak to you about the merchandisers of murder, some of whom happen to be the guardian angels and officers in the American Liberty League. These are the days of tribulation and grief for our nation. Not at Valley Forge with the patriots starving on the hillsides were courage and determination needed as they are on this day. Not at Gettysburg where it was decided that this nation could not exist half slave and half free. I believe in the spark of patriotism is still burning in your hearts, although it has been drenched by untold tears of unnecessary suffering, suffering wrought upon you by your greedy, ignorant fellow citizens. I believe that when you hear this story, that spark will burst into flame of holy indignation, like the brothers of Christ that you are, and you will gird up your loins to drive the money changers and the modern Iscariots from the temple of our national home. It is a story so repulsive to human intelligence that it makes one hesitate to name its chief characters merchandisers of murder. I call them cruel men who, with hearts of stone and corroded consciences, have besmirched our nation's fair name, wicked men who, by their greedy treachery, have humbled us before the parliaments of men, unchristly men who, mocking the policies of the Prince of Peace, have won for Benedict Arnold the songs of praise. Men who have made it impossible by their own infamy for Judas Iscariot to greet his first competitor. I am deeply stirred by the news which has come from Washington this past week. As I turned it over in my mind, I unconsciously reverted to the inspired words of Pius XI, who, having written of the immortally associated with the concentration of wealth, says, This concentration of power has led to a threefold struggle for domination. First, there is the struggle for dictatorship in the economic sphere itself. Then the fierce battle to acquire control of the state so that its resources and authority may be abused in the economic struggle, finally the clash between nations. The meaning of these words which I have read to you never dawned upon my mind with such clarity until I coupled them with the United States Senate Committee investigating munitions manufacturing. With noonday clearness, the whole scheme unfolded itself in the story associated with the name DuPont. For weeks we were learning about the electric boat company and the way submarines of American manufacture were sold. We learned that our Department of State promoted the sale of this company's submarines to Spain. Here was control of the state to such an extent that its authority was used in the economic struggle. 
We learn that the electric boat company had hired Rear Admiral Long to represent its interests, not ours, at the Geneva Peace Conference some years ago. We were shocked to discover that the same electric boat company was so influential as to persuade Admiral Niblock, the actual head of our Naval Intelligence Bureau, to send our American submarines around the South America as part of a private corporation sale plan sales plan to sell submarines to foreign nations and thereby to start an armament race, thereby to breed war while the Geneva Conference on Arms Limitation was in session. As the investigation at Washington continued during the past few days, we were informed that the American battleships had sailed down to Rio to demonstrate arms and munitions, and that the United States cruiser Raleigh was sent to Constantinople at the request of Driggs Gun Manufacturing Company to help sell its wares of warfare. Do you not think that the United States government is controlled by the munition manufacturers? Wait until the end of next week and you will find how the munition manufacturers are controlled by the bankers. Need I recite this litany of horrible disclosures, of nauseating facts brought to light by the Senate investigation? Behold, in Germany, in England, and in our own America, the munitions and arms manufacturers are so linked together under patent and sales agreements that secret processes for manufacturing are exchanged, sales territories are allotted, and profits on death and destruction are divided. Collusion, bribery of high officials, and government corruption were proven to be the elements in making munition sales. At last, the unbelievable truth must be believed. According to sworn testimony, it is the practice of our American corporations to arm both warring nations, to arm revolutionary factions in case of peace, and to encourage a war for military and naval supremacy between friendly nations. Away with the Prince of Peace! Crucify him! Crucify him! Give us the Barabbas of war is the motto of the American man munition manufacturers. The Senate community discovered that every effort Congress made to regulate the shipment of arms, every treaty respecting the traffic in arms, in munitions and in powder, has been defied by these manufacturers. Principal in the Senate investigation of munition manufacturers come those sterling patriots and lovers of our Constitution, the DuPonts. Co-founders of the American Liberty League, this family claims residence in Delaware for over a century and a quarter. This family witnessed American liberty in its cradle and is seemingly happy to follow it to its grave. While to this DuPont company, motor manufacturing is only a side issue. Their big interest is munitions, powder, powder machinery, explosives, nitroglycerin, and chemicals. Warfare is their game. They have become so wealthy that they dominate their economic sphere. There is scarcely another powder company in America worth mentioning. On go the DuPonts from fabulous wealth to economic domination. Now the next step must be taken. In the language of Pius XI, it is the fierce struggle to acquire control of the state so that its resources and authority may be used in the economic struggle. On go the DuPonts. Do they attempt to gain control of the government? These lovers of liberty, these co-founders of the American Liberty League, let the testimony before the Senate committee answer that question. So great was their control and domination over our government that when their factory was short of a certain rare explosive, they borrowed 60,000 pounds of it from the government of the United States out of a total stock of 67,000 pounds to sell to a foreign power. That is point number one. 
Point number two, they persuaded General Charles Humphrey to assist them in negotiating a sale through the Polish embassy. That is using an army officer as a peddler of powder. Point number three, the War Department and the Navy Department of the United States government were so placed under the domination of the DuPonts that military secrets have been released to foreign powers on condition that the DuPonts would obtain the order. Military secrets that we thought were sacred were traded as a kick-in and a payoff so that the orders would go to the DuPonts. Point number four. So vast was the power of the DuPonts over both our war and navy departments that the in officers thereof, along with the officers of the army and navy intelligence departments, actually supplied the DuPont Corporation with military secrets rather than have this private corporation risk failure in its operations. Point number five, the British firm of nobles and the British Imperial Chemical Limited are so interlocked with the DuPont Corporation that it is hardly possible to keep from England a secret in the economic sphere in which the DuPont Company is interested. Point number six, one of the brothers, Felix A. DuPont reached Lieutenant Colonel J. H. Mackey, member of the Canadian Parliament, who played a major part in the purchase of munitions during the war and whose knowledge of the Far East is impressive. Mackey's job was simply to sell the Japanese the powder of DuPont. He just happens to know that Japan needed the DuPonts, so the DuPonts hired him as their representative, equipped him with the very advantages America had over Japan, and rushed to Washington to confirm the arrangement with the Department of War and the Navy Department. The War Department answered that powder and other munition sales to Japan, will enable the army to learn how much and what kind of powder Japan was buying, and then by deduction, the army would then be in a position to obtain a considerable amount of information of military value. The Navy Department answered that, although Japan was a potential enemy, the importance of the information would reach the military and naval officers would offset this. May I comment on this most damnable philosophy? If it means anything, it means that the Department of Justice should arm the Dillingers in this company with the latest type of Thompson submachine gun so that, in return, the department may know just what guns kill its agents. Point number seven. The DuPonts never missed a sale because of patriotism. Take as an example the incident of the mechanical dipper used in the manufacture of nitrocellulose. Japan wanted the dipper. Although her agents searched England for one, they could not get it there. Imperial Chemical Industries Limited turned the request over to America and to the DuPonts. The DuPonts rushed to Bagley of the Naval Intelligence Department and receive this opinion on the proposed sale. It is not only permissible but desirable for American firms to sell such equipment to the Japanese. The Japanese will undoubtedly purchase what they desire anyhow. It is desirable for America to secure the business and the Navy to be informed of the amount and nature of the purchases, which information would be lacking if the purchases were made in Europe. That is the patriotism of the DuPonts and of the particular naval intelligence official. They would sell the flag from the top of the capital if it would increase the profits for the DuPonts. Carried to its conclusion, it simply means that the police should sell dope to the children who will get it anyhow, for then they will know how much the children use. The mechanical dipper will help dip the blood out of our American boys. 
It used to be ours, but now it is common property. The Army Intelligence Service was approached on this DuPont sale to Japan. Major Wilson, Major Marley, and Major Froner had no objection. The Department of State was approached. Here the DuPonts were informed that any embargo on the Mechanical Dipper might be regarded by Japan as an unfriendly act and tend to render more difficult the already delicate situation in the Orient. What comment is necessary? In our infancy, America defeated the proudest empire in the world, Britannia. In our youth, we defended our rights to the seven seas successfully against that empire. Today, we actually equip our potential enemies among the world powers and, out of fear of offending Japan, our navy, our army, and our state departments all approve a sale of a secret process to Japan. In those days, we had wooden ships and iron men. Today, we have ships of steel and DuPonts. The dollar of a DuPont capital always seeks its profit. With Japan in the hands of Mackey of Canada, Colonel W. N. Taylor, European sales agent of the DuPonts, was ordered to work on Russia in 1928. Poor American Liberty League, sponsored by the identical patriots who sought the communist ruble as they armed the communist rebel, and with the same intensity sought the yen of the Nipponese. Let us see how a Liberty Leaguer speaks among his own, not for publication, but off the record. This is a private communication from the lobbyist to the DuPonts. I quote from the testimony introduced this past week. Congress is too short-sighted to see the necessity of appropriating funds to keep private manufacturers of munitions in business. The Army and Navy would spend money if they could get it, and because they cannot, are doing all they can possibly do, and that is to help us make sales to other nations. But this is our country, and not the country of Congress. That is the language used in reporting to the DuPonts the assistance our War, Navy, and State Departments gave to DuPont sales abroad. What wonder, then, that Pius XI writes, the whole economic life has become hard, cruel, and relentless in a ghastly measure. Furthermore, the intermingling and scandalous confusing of the duties and officers of civil authority and of economics has gone as far as to degrade the majesty of the state. The state which should be the supreme arbiter, ruling in kingly fashion for above party contention, intent only on the common good, has become instead a slave, bound over to the service of human passion and greed. This is our country and not the country of Congress, echoes the DuPonts. From mere wealth to domination of the field, from domination through unchecked competition to dictatorship in the powder, the powder machinery and chemical fields, from this step to the control of the state where the war department becomes a smart salesman, the navy a peddler, and the department of state a foreign sales manager. The DuPont Corporation has run the gamut. From the control of the state, one last step must be taken in its true sequence. That is the clash between states themselves. That is war. If America is sent into war, War to take us out of the depression. The American submarine will already be in the hands of the enemy. All the world knows just one submarine. Ours. Ours, whether made in Germany, England, France, Italy, Japan, Russia, or at home. Ours with a profit to the electric boat company. 
Our submarines challenge our use of the sea. When our Navy meets the Navy of any foreign power, mark you any superiority we have in the design or construction was long since sold to our enemies. When our arm meet in the field of battle, DuPont powder will send shot and shell screaming into their ranks. There is no advantage to the American soldiers. When the new gases developed in the laboratories of the United States pour forth death and destruction, even our own civilian population, our women and children, will be killed by the self-same gases. Who will win the next war, communist or capitalist? It matters not. The DuPonts will be the real winners. Yellow or white race, it matters not. The DuPonts cannot lose. Europe or America, they are there as they are here. This is our country, not the country of Congress. I may ask my audience to pray, Almighty God, that he cast a protecting arm over the Senate committee until the end of this week. That must not be disturbed. Let America have truth, though the powers of hell, aided and abetted by the DuPonts, the steel corporations, and the bankers will, in their diabolical wisdom, try to hide the truth. The truth that America harbors traitors to all that is good. The truth that we harbor merchandisers of murder. These are the men who, at this season of peace, have been consistently perverting the temple of Christ into a brothel of blood. These are the men who have made a mockery of democracy as, step by step, they superimposed their credo of killing upon the various branches of our government. We have arrived at the point in our national destiny when we are determined to make of the United States of America a real democracy where our government with its State Department and every other department will not operate for the welfare of merchandisers of murder, but for the peaceful welfare of those who believe in the policies of the Prince of Peace. Away with these dictatorships! Give us real democracy. This is why the National Union for Social Justice was instituted. Choose between it and the American Liberty League with its individualism, its war profiteering, its merchandisers of murder members, its salesmen of slaughter, as represented by the DuPonts and their frontmen, who prate to us about a liberty that is slavery and a prosperity that is death.